Hi, everybody. Today, we are going to start with the Turing machines. So in the previous lectures and videos, we have seen regular languages. Then we move to context-free languages. And now we are going to make a big jump and Instead of going in order and studying P and NP, we are going to move directly to decidable languages and a very important model, which is that of Turing machines. So a Turing machine is like a DFA, a deterministic finite automata, but with some very important and critical differences. The machine has access to an infinite tape, which we can depict like this, which initially contains the input and blank everywhere else. So blank is written with this underscore sign and is here. And the input, we can think of it as ones and zeros. The machine can both read and write on the tape and can move both ways on the tape. Also, unlike DFAs, the accept and reject actions happen immediately. So in a DFA, you accept if when you finish reading the input, you are in accept state. But with the Turing machine, you accept as soon as you enter an accept state. And this makes sense because the machine can go back and forth on the input. So there is no notion of finishing to read the input. So there are some details to worry about. Um, we're going to think that the, the tape is infinite only to the right. So I have these dot, dot, dots on the right. If the machine tries to move to the left of the tape, it just stuck on the first symbol. And the machine has one head, which is written with this V on one tape of the cell, on one cell of the tape. In one step, in one computational step, the Turing machine can change the state, just like a DFA, can read and or write the cell under the head, and can move to the left or right of one cell. Okay. And again, if the Turing machine attempts to go left of the first cell, so if the head is here, the machine tries to move left, it just stays put. We may write transitions for to the machines just like the DFAs. So we have a state Q0 and a state Q1, and we have a transition which is an arrow with label one goes to blank comma R. Okay. So what does this thing mean? It means if the machine is in state Q0 and the tape cell under the head contains a one, then the machine should write blank on the tape, should move the head to the right, and should go to state Q1. Let us give an example. This is a machine that recognizes the language A to the N, B to the N, C to the N. Okay. And it has a start state, like before, and a bunch of transitions. As you can see, diagrams get pretty complicated for Turing machines. And that's one reason why we actually we will not be using them much. But right now, to tie to our DFA lectures, let us see a few diagrams. Again, typically we do not draw state diagrams and that's because they get very complicated. Hence, they're useless. There is an equivalent easier notation which is just explain the algorithm that's behind the Turing machine and we're going to discuss this uh, later. In general, it's sufficient to give a high level description of the Turing machine. So for a Turing machine, like before, 
for the language a to the n, b to the n, c to the n, we may just give an English language description of the algorithm that's behind it as follows. So the machine M on input W is going to scan the tape and is going to cross off 1A, 1B, and 1C. If none of the symbols is found, then you may accept. That means you cross everything off. If not all of the symbols is found or you or were found in the wrong order, then reject. Otherwise, you go back to one. Okay. So the machine does one pass and tries to match one A with one B and one C, according to the, to this language. If you cannot do so, then if you cannot do so because there is no such symbol, that means the machine should accept because everything was crossed off in the right way. Otherwise, if you cannot do so because they didn't find all the symbols, so they found them in the wrong order, it may reject. In the state diagram, it just, it's a complicated formalism to implement the above. Some comments on this that we said cross off. Okay, so how do we cross off? Well, we need to have some extra tape symbols. You can think that you have tape symbol pound and X through this crossing. And let's now see an example with this particular language. Okay, so here is an input. The input is in the language, as you can see, and the head starts on the first symbol. So what happens? First of all, some remarks, just like for the FAs and other things. Um, we are not going to write symbols twice uh, if it doesn't change, okay? So here, for example, I was reading a, a blank. I need, not try that, I need to, write, to, write, to write the blank. This is intended. If it's not written, it means that you don't change the symbol. Also, to save space, I'm going to put stuff into curly brackets to indicate OR. So this means if the tape square is either A or, or B, you go to the right and you move to reject. Okay, let's see how we begin. So we, we, we begin in the start state, now in green, and the head is on the first symbol. Okay, and then there is an A under the head, match with this. So you follow this transition, you write a pound, and you move to the right. So the head now is here. And now in this state, which I call the scan A's for us, this is like a comment in a programming language. Um, you say you're supposed to scan the A, so as long as you... Um, And an A or an X, you're going to move right. That's what we do. Now we don't have uh, A's anymore. We, we have a B, so we're going to move to the state scan B's. So we go to scan B's. Then we move to scan C's. And then if I see a blank under the head, I'm going to move to the state go left. The purpose of this is just to continue to go left until the, first, the marker. That's why I put a pound to mark the, the beginning. Then I do one more pass on this. I'm going to cross off this A, this B, and this C until I get here. Go back. Then again, I'm going to find A, B, or C, but there is none of them. As we mentioned earlier, if you don't find these symbols, you can accept. And on the accept state, I'm done. The string is in the language. Let's see another example. Let's see a reject example. The string is not in the language because you have, for example, more Bs than As. So we start here, we cross off 1A, okay? Then cross off 1B, we scan the Bs, cross off 1C, go back. Now, what happens? Find the next A, I'm going to cross the A, scan the A's, scan the B's. And now I'm here, but I did not find any C, which means I go to the reject state, 
and reject. Done. The string is not in the language. Here is another example of a machine for the language just over the alphabet A consisting of strings whose length is a power of two. Okay, so this is the language of A to the two to the N where N is at least zero. So strings in this language are A, 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 and so on. How do we do uh, this? Well, on input W, if there's only one A, if one A you accept. Otherwise, we can cross off every other A on the tape. If you find a odd number of A's, you can reject. Otherwise, you can continue. Okay. So this is just saying that you know if the length is a power of two, if you divide by two each time, you should always have an even reminder. Okay. So for example, if you start with eight A's, you're going to go to four A's, then two A's, then one A, and then you're going to accept. If you start with the 12 A's, you will go to six A's, three A's, and then this thing is odd, and you reject. And this would be a machine, a state diagram for that machine. And this is an example in which you have four A's. I'm going to cross off every other A. Again, cross off. And you accept. So an important thing is that unlike DFA's PDAs, TM computation, Turing machine computation may never halt. Okay? That is, it may continue forever without ever entering an accept or reject state. This is an important way in which Turing machines are different from PDAs and DFA's. And this corresponds to when your computer freezes. Right. Sometimes you're doing something, um, and you know the computer freezes; it doesn't move anymore, and this corresponds to the machine doesn't have, that does not finish the computation. Here is a very basic example of a machine which doesn't halt, doesn't stop. Okay, so you enter here, and every time you read an A or put a blank, you simply go right. So the machine will just proceed. The computation goes on forever. OK, now it's time to formally define a Turing machine. OK, well, we can define a Turing machine as a seven tuple. We're now experts of such definitions after, after having given definitions of DFAs and NFAs. So we have a final set of states. We have the input alphabet, and we include always the blank symbol in the alphabet. This is the input alphabet, OK? So the alphabet with which the input is, is written at the beginning. And then we can use a larger tape alphabet, which is gamma, OK? And gamma uh, should contain sigma. and should also contain the blank symbol, OK? So then we have a transition uh, function that, that does what? If you're in some state, you read something from the tape, then you move to a state, you write something on the tape, and then you move the head either left or right. Okay? Q0 is a start state. Then we have an accept state and a reject state. And the accept state should be different from the reject state. Mm. Very good. So. How does the TM compute? Well, a configuration of a Turing machine specifies the contents of the tape, the state, and the head location. Okay, and we're going to write the configuration as UQV, where Q is, is a state, and U, U and V are elements of gamma star, so are sequences of tape symbols. And the meaning of this is that the Turing machine is in state Q and the head is on the first symbol of V, the first symbol of V, and the tape contains UV. Okay, and the blanks may not be shown. This is a compact notation which is useful to write down configurations. So here is an example now of a Turing machine is in state Q7, 
here is how the tape looks like and the head position. What would be the configuration for this picture? Think about it. How can you write compactly this configuration using this notation? Well, we may write this as 0, 0, Q7, 1, 1, right? So this 0, 0 is U. This 1, 1 is V. And Q7 is just Q. Okay. And the meaning, again, is that the head of the machine is on the first symbol of V, which will be this one here, just like here. Okay, that's the configuration. So when the machine computes, it goes through many configurations. Specifically, we are going to say that a configuration C yields a configuration C prime if the TM goes from C to C prime in one step. Okay, and now there is a bunch of rules to make this precise. They're not particularly interesting, is what you you would expect. Uh, but still, uh, to be precise, let's go through them. Uh, we're going to say that, that uh, um, UAQBV yields UQ prime, UQ prime ACV, if what happens. Well, here um, A and B are just elements of gamma. Okay? They, they tape, they're just tape symbols, while U and V belong to gamma star, or sequences of those symbols. So now the machine, remember, has the head on B, so it's treating a, a B. So if the transition say, well, if you're in state Q and you read a B, you should go to state Q prime, write a C and move that to the left. Then the corresponding configuration is this, right? This B now has become a C. The head has moved to the left, which means now it will be on A. And it is why Q prime has moved to the left of A and the state has become Q prime. Okay. Similarly, um, you know, if the transition says to go right, you get this, right? I'm still writing a C, but now the head is on the right. Uh, if I don't write anything here to the right of Q, I think of it as just being a blank. Um, and, you know, if Q is on the first symbol of the tape, and I remember, if I move left, actually the, the tape is not, the head is not moving left, so you stay put, you, you simply change the C, you simply change the B into a C, and, you know, if you go right, you just go to C, Q prime B from this. Okay. So the machine will start in a configuration. So the start configuration of a Turing machine on input W is simply Q0W, the start state with the head on the first symbol of W. The accept configuration we're going to define to be any configuration which has a Q accept as a state. And the reject configuration, we're going to define it to be any configuration which has Q reject. And a halt or stop configuration is any configuration which is either accept or, or uh, reject. Finally, we're going to say that the Turing machine accepts or reject or halts on an input W if what? Well, just like for the FAs, we had a trace, now we're going to have a sequence of configurations. So if there exists configuration C1, C2, dot, dot, CK, such that C1 is a start configuration, CI yields a CI plus one, and CK is accept. If you want to accept or reject, if you want to reject or halt if you want to halt. Here is an example for the machine from before for the language of strings over A whose length is a power of two. <clears throat> Here is a string in the language, A, 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 A. We started with the Start configuration, which has state Q0 and the head of the first symbol of the input. And then what do we do? We add a pound and we move the head to the right. 
Okay, and we go to configuration like this. We come back. Continue. In the end, we enter state queue accept. Computation is over, the machine has accepted. Now, critical definition. We are going to say that a language L is decidable if there exists a Turing machine such that for every input W, if W is in the language, the machine accepts W. If W is not in the language, the machine rejects W. And now a very important point, is this definition the same as simply saying that W is in L if and only if M accepts W? What do you think? Think about it and remember the key difference between DFAs and PMs. Is this the same? It's not. It is not the same as, as this, okay? Because of the possibility that the machine may loop forever, may freeze, may, may crash, may not stop, may not halt. Okay? So in this definition of decidable, we are asking for something more. Okay? We are asking that the Turing machine halts on every input. And such a Turing machine is called a decider. Decider is when you always stop at some point. You don't go on forever. Okay, we are also we are also interested in machine which may not stop, and so we define to be the language of a Turing machine M to be the set of strings which are accepted by W. Recall this means that the string W is in L of M, the language of M, if and only if M accepts W, and we call such a language recognizable. So language is recognizable if there exists a Turing machine M whose language is L. Okay. Note that recognizable is not the same as decidable. Okay. De decidable is a more stringent notion. It's asking more. It's asking that on every input the, the machine stops. We are generally more interested in decidable languages. But recognizable languages are very useful for the theory of computation. OK. So another important leap is that so far, DFAs, context free grammar to machine, recognize languages. OK? But yet, the machines can also write on the tape. So they can also compute functions. OK? So. I can think that a function that maps strings to strings is computable if there exists a Turing machine M such that on every input W, Turing machine halts, and when it halts, it has F of W on the tape. Okay. So all common functions, such as addition, multiplication, division, etc., turn out to be computable. Okay, so what does it mean? Consider, for example, the plus function. Okay, we can think of this as a function that takes pairs of natural numbers and outputs their sum. Okay, so the input would be a pair given with brackets and with a comma. And the question is, how do you actually write down for a Turing machine? a pair with brackets and commas, well, but any reasonable uh, representation will do. So for example, we can use extra symbols for brackets and commas, okay? Or you can just use zeros and ones and encode them in a binary. Indeed, your computer um, operates that way. Okay, here is just an example to make everything visual. For the plus function, 
here is how the machine operates on an input. And here I use an extra symbol for brackets and for the comma. So the machine starts moving the head, reads these symbols, goes on for many steps until it, it has written the output on the tape, 71. Excellent. So, so far, this was kind of definitions and background on Turing machines. And now the big question is, how powerful are Turing machines? We saw the FAs and context-free grammars. They have some power, but also some pretty strong limitations. Well, one can show that regular and context-free languages are desirable. And we also saw in the previous, in the previous examples that some non-context-free languages is decidable. Okay, so two machines deciders are strictly more powerful than context-free languages. We also mentioned that two machines can compute functions. Okay, not just accept each other, but they can actually compute functions. So, what else can a two machine do? Do you have any guesses? Well, surprisingly, Turing machines are very powerful. Pick your favorite programming language, say Java, and there's a theorem that says that for every language L, every computational task L, you can decide L in Java. If and only if, you can decide L on a Turing machine. So in terms of deciding languages, they are as powerful as Java or any other language, Python, C, Smalltalk, and so on. Everything you program, you can program on a Turing machine. Program, algorithm, Turing machines, they all mean the same thing, at least in this class. Is this theorem hard to prove? It is not very hard to prove. It's tedious, but not very hard. In one direction is easy. If something is decidable by a Turing machine, it's not hard to program, to give a Java program that simulates the Turing, the, the Turing machine. In the other direction, a little bit more work is needed, but it's not very hard. You just tediously go through all the instructions of Java and ensure that each of them has an implementation via Turing machine. All right, duh. so who cares about this? So why not just use Java? Who cares about Turing machines, right? Well, Java and Turing machines are indeed equivalent. However, when you want to design programs, okay, you actually writing down programs, Java is more convenient. It's higher level, the programs are shorter, it's readable by human beings, unlike the state diagrams, which I pictured before. You do this in the algorithms class. In this class, instead, we're after understanding the fundamental limits of computing. For that, Turing machines are more convenient. Why? Because it, it has a simpler description, simpler configurations, and simple head movements. Just think that I was able to give you the entire definition, self-contained of Turing machine computation in a few slides. If you want to be extremely precise about Java, it will take your book, right? So this is what you do in this class, the fundamental limits of computing. Okay. So what is really, if you think about it, what is really the main reason why Turing machines are better than Java, for instance? It'll be simpler, fine, but there is one important aspect which is different between Turing machines and Java. Turing machine creation is local, local. So all the action happens around the tape symbols which are adjacent to the head. Okay? All the action happens in the tape symbols which are adjacent to the head. 
This thing is not true for Java. There is no head. And in principle, any tape or memory symbol can change because if you have Java, you have an array, you associate it with some variable i, i can be a number. So in one operation, you can change any symbol on the tape or memory. So the locality of Turing machine is exploited critically in several results that we're going to see. And now let us make this important aspect more precise. This is the important fact, which is the locality of Turing machine computation. Okay, so a Turing machine configuration CI yields a configuration CI plus one, if and only if something very simple happens. If and only if for every J, the six symbols in these windows in this window are consistent with the Turing machine transition function delta. What, what are the six symbols? Are the symbol j, j plus one, and j plus two in each of the two configurations. Okay. So for example, let's look at these two configurations. Okay. And I'm asking, does CI, does CI yield CI plus one? Okay. Well, to know that, uh, we need to check if for every J, the six symbols in this green window are consistent, okay? And this, of course, depends on the transition function, okay? Which I have not written, but uh, you can imagine. Okay, so if the transition function says that in state Q2, uh, reading a symbol sigma, you're going to move to some say Q and write, and write an X and go to the right. This thing will be consistent with this window here, right? Because I don't know what, what I'm reading, but there could be a symbol Sigma that the machine is, is reading, which will cause me to go to some state, which I don't know where it is, but some state writing an X. I, I see the X, so the, the X has to match the transition. The rest, I don't know. So this check passes. But every check has to pass. So then I move to the next window. Here, actually, you only have one choice because you use, you use everything. So this has to be consistent with delta Q2A uh, being Q3. Write an X and move to the right. And again, for the next window, you only have one choice because I will stay in, in the second thing. For the, for the next one, there's more than uh, one choice, okay? Because in the in this window, you don't know which state the machine is, start, is starting with. So you so you're asking if you can obtain state state Q3, okay? And write some symbol sigma that you don't see and move to to the right, starting from some state Q that you don't know because it's not in the window, and reading an A, which you know, okay? So if all these checks pass, then the configuration yield the other. If for every J, this window, this two by three window with six symbols, is consistent with Delta, then CI yields the CI plus one. Otherwise, there could be some bogus configuration that does not pass the checks. So for example, this, this thing here in red is not consistent because for one reason, you cannot have two state symbols, okay? This configuration here also is not because this C was changed into an A, but that cannot happen because the head is nowhere near those symbols. Okay. This locality of two machine combination will play a critical role and will be exploded soon. Okay. And now the next question is, is there anything beyond Java or Turing machines? Okay. So fine, Turing machine is the same as Java. Is there anything beyond? And the Church Turing thesis 
very important thesis, very influential in, in uh, computer science, is that anything which is effectively computable, and this is in quotes because it's not a formal notion, anything which is, which is effectively comp computable can be computed on Java or Turing machines. This is, is not a theorem. It is a belief that every computational model that humans may ever consider, so even if you work with quantum computing, DNA computing, uh, you know, computing based on, on uh, weather, termites, uh, you know, algae, and so on, would still be equivalent to Turing machines. Okay, so that's it. Turing machines are all that you have. Again, it is not a theorem, it is a belief. Still, uh, if you're curious, you can go online and there is a paper called Proof of the Church Turing Thesis. Uh, and what they do uh, is to basically go to the, you know, the simplest possible, uh, possibly the simplest possible, um, you know, concept of computation so that, that actually it, it can be implemented in, in, in a Turing machine. <clears throat> okay. And, you know, the last leap that we're going to make, that's going to make things easier. So, so far we've been working with simple languages like, you know, zero to the N, one to the N, uh, strings of W, A to the I, B to J, J to the K. This stuff is kind of boring, right? I mean, it's useful for many things, but it's not really, uh, it doesn't look very powerful. So next, we actually are going to consider much more powerful uh, languages. Things like, you know, the set of, uh, of DFAs, which do something, or a set of uh, pairs, MW, where M is at the M and something, G or G is a graph and something. So here the input is much more structured, okay? It's a DFA, it's a Turing machine, it's a program, is is a graph. So how are we going to represent this, these things, D, M, W, G? Well, it's not so important, okay? Any reasonable representation will do. For example, we can use the formal definitions over the, you know, the English language alphabet. Okay. And this is going to allow us to define much more complicated and far-reaching languages. And the next topic is, is there anything that, that a Turing machine cannot do? What do you think? Is there anything? We will see that next time. Bye now.